And our next speaker, our next, our next speaker is, me. is Will Marchant. Did I get it? Uh, very good. Okay, and we need to find your presentation. Yes, please. Will Marchant, I work for Space Sciences Lab at University of California, Berkeley. Um, Will Rachelson is here. Um, he's also from UCB. Uh, the title of the talk is Icon and and Philosophy, and I'm spending most of my time on Icon, and they're paying the bill for me to be here, so they get top billing on this. Um, but the story really starts on New Star, which is a Caltech mission that I worked on. Lovely, thanks, sir. Um, and so you'll hear me talk about New Star an awful lot, and I may also mention Sweep, which is an instrument um, suite on Solar Probe Plus that we're working on. Um, and so the title is End to End Operations Philosophy, but really what I wanted to talk with you about is our attempts to um, follow the test like you fly, fly like you test mantra. And what we did on New Star for that and what we're trying to do on ICON for that and where we're f succeeding and where we're um, failing. Um, a little bit of background. So um, we've uh, been operating a handful of missions at, uh, at Berkeley over the years. I got my start um, actually on EUVE where I was the flight software engineer for that. Um, but as I mentioned, New Star, which is a low Earth orbit astrophysics mission operated um, out of Berkeley for Caltech, um, launched in 2012. Um, it used an orbital spacecraft bus and a Pegasus launch. And um, one of the things that we specified in the ICON proposal was that we wanted to do a respin of New Star um, uh, because of the experience base there, and we thought it would be cheaper to do. Um, just a little bit of background, we have a, a small multi-mission operations facility at Berkeley, um, an exciting photograph of screens. You know, it's not, it's not like mission control used to be with cool consoles and pneumatic tubes for delivering donuts and apples and things. Um, it's all just computer screens. But we do have um, an 11-meter dish up at Berkeley that we can use for controlling most of the missions. Um, we can't use that on New Star because it was a six-degree inclination orbit, so we never see it. So New Star gets run from our facility out of uh, a Melindi, courtesy of the University of Rome and the Italian Space Agency, and uh, a ground station in Singapore mostly, and some Tidris stuff. And if there are questions during this, feel free to raise your hands, and I'll try and address them during, or we can, um, we can try and go to the end. Uh, you've seen this. Um, the rack in the bottom is RF stuff for controlling the antenna. It's all pretty standard. Um, a little bit about the ICON. So um, we just uh, got our launch vehicle. It's going to be a Pegasus out of uh, Reagan test, swat, test site, excuse me, which is Kwajalein in the South Pacific. Um, as I mentioned, it's a Leostar 2 bus, so that's a catalog item from Orbital Sciences Corporation um, for doing uh, low Earth orbit science missions, and it's very similar to what we flew on New Star. Um, there is a new spacecraft CNDH computer. Um, the old architecture was no longer uh, sustainable as a commercial product because of, of parts issues, is my understanding, and so there's a spin on a new... Um, spacecraft computer that we're going to be, I believe, the first um, users of. Um, it's a nice spacecraft, three orbit stabilized, uh, no consumables, um, and uh, we're planning for June 2017 launch into a relatively uh, a low altitude uh, sort of medium inclination orbit. And we'll run that out of Berkeley again. We do have views to the ICON orbit, and so we'll be um, uh, taking most of the passes off of our dish, mainly because we're cheap. Um, you know, we're university employees. We don't get paid overtime. Um, there's, there's really no overhead um, for profit for the university, and so we can keep our costs down. And then um, uh, we're going to do some uh, uh, passes out of wallops, and uh, we have an arrangement with uh, San Diego Ground Station for some of our other missions. And the plan is for um, a two-year on-orbit operation. Uh, New Star had essentially a single instrument payload. It was a Caltech X-ray um, astrophysics payload. Um, it was kind of two instruments because there were two detectors, two sets of mirror optics, um, but essentially one payload. Um, ICON is a lot more complicated with four discrete instrument teams. Two of the instrument teams are at Berkeley. 
Um, one of the instrument teams is at Naval Research Lab, and they have actually two identical instruments, one that looks forward and one that looks aft. And then uh, University of Texas at Dallas has the IVM instrument suite, which once again has two instruments, pretty much identical, one looking forward and one looking aft. So uh, this mission is a lot more complicated for us than New Star. Um, I was basically the liaison running all the New Star payload um, uh, EGSC issues, and then with four instrument teams, we hired a second person. We're splitting the load, so I'm going to take NRL and the UT Dallas stuff, and Carl Dobson is taking the uh, the two Berkeley, um, the FUV and the EUV instruments. Um, eye candy for the uh, Pegasus launch. Uh, ICON is a fields and particle and an in-situ um, sensing mission, and so it's, uh, the instrument suite actually points, um, is facing the Earth, and then it's looking off at the horizon, and the intent is to make atmospheric measurements um, uh, sort of tomographically, so uh, the spacecraft has to do some gyrations um, to look back into the same volume of air that it passed a few minutes before. So it'll look, it'll look forward and it'll make a bunch of measurements, and then a few minutes later it'll, it'll sweep back again to try and look back through that volume so it gets a, a cross-section, and then uh, the attempt in software on the ground is to try and figure out, um, you know, what's actually going on in that cross-sectioned area. Um, although the IVM instrument does do some in situ measurements, so they actually measure ion velocities right where the spacecraft is. And uh, the whole idea here is to try and um, study interaction of uh, energy between the upper atmosphere and, um, and the edge of outer space. So um, how does energy go back and forth? How does the atmosphere affect the, the LEO space environment and vice versa? Um, lots of partners here, uh, mentioned Orbital Sciences Corporation, so they're doing both the spacecraft bus and the launch vehicle at this point. So it's a fairly conventional um, mission architecture here, ICON in low Earth orbit. We will have TDRIS um, commanding and telemetry available for some mission phases, and that will be for things like solar array deployments and uh, watching instruments once high voltage power supplies have been turned on to, to see if we need to turn things off. And then uh, data through the various ground stations will, will be uh, most of our contacts to the Mission Operations Center at Berkeley. And then we're also doing the Science Operations um, Facility at Berkeley. And then we'll be archiving all of our data to, um, to Goddard. Once again, pretty common architecture. Uh, a lot of this stuff is already in place from New Star. There are actually very few changes. Uh, the biggest issues are Science Operations Center software because the, you know, the difference between astrophysics and, and uh, atmospheric science is, is pretty massive and it's, uh, and it's different teams. So there's going to be a lot of work on that front. But from uh, actually running the spacecraft bus, it's, it's pretty easy. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Um, on New Star, we had the opportunity, the, the Caltech folks had lost a software engineer who was going to be responsible for their ground support um, system. They didn't want to hire another person full time, and so they asked us if, if there was a victim who'd be willing to, to do that stuff for them, and I was uh, elected because I was out of the building at the time. Um, so uh, I was responsible basically for coming in, and we had discussions with the Caltech folks about their um, instrument development ground support software. And uh, they had software from previous missions, and um, people liked some of it, and people hated some of it. And so that's a pretty common story, right? That, you know, no matter what you implement, it, you can't please everybody. So um, we had a long chat with them, and we ta told them about the ITOS system, which is a... Uh, uh, it's the instrument test and operation system, which came out of Goddard Space Flight Center and has been commercialized through the Hammers Corporation. Um, but because of our experience with, with Goddard, we, we subbed to them on most of our NASA missions. Um, that's what we've been using in our mission operations center, our multi-mission operations center. And so um, we talked to the Caltech folks and said, hey, you know, this is what ITOS looks like. You know, we, we know you hate these portions of it, but you think these other portions look good, and if we can use this for your instrument development effort, then when you get to spacecraft INT, things will be 
pretty easy because you'll have developed windows and you'll understand the databases and all the procedures will, you know, the, uh, the procs uh, to do commanding and things will hopefully, if we do our job right, will just work right into the spacecraft INT, the on-orbit checkout, and the operations phase. And so they very bravely said that they would sign up to that if I was willing to, um, to handhold it and, and actually make it happen. Now, in parallel, at the same time, we were just getting off the ground with the spacecraft team at uh, Orbital Sciences Corporation. And their traditional approach, which um, is fairly common in the industry, at least in my experience, is that they had um, uh, in-house software package that they typically use during the spacecraft bus development phase. And then um, you typically hand over at the end of the, of the um, INT phase on the ground to using the software system for whoever is going to be operating the observatory. And so we walked in at the beginning of that phase and we said, hey folks, if we supply manpower or person power to um, support you in the effort, would you be willing to use our ITOS system and the, and the ancillary tools that we've developed um, during your spacecraft INT effort? And it took um, a, a little bit of, um, of convincing and we had to pony up the resources to bring people in um, to train up their people because um, they didn't want to just have to start over from scratch and, and pay for that. Um, but once again, they were very brave and they said, sure, if you folks are willing to come in and help us with the expertise and get things going, yes, we will use ITOS um, from the beginning of the spacecraft development phase. And that was on Newstar. Um, and that actually worked out really successfully. So um, we have sort of this concept that um, as, the, as mission phases develop, you um, start to supply higher and higher fidelity um, simulators or engineering models or actually flight pieces of hardware and software um, until you finally get to the point where you're working with the actual observatory as you're integrating it and then getting on orbit. Um, and so uh, right from the get-go, um, now, let me qualify this by saying that in the very beginning of instrument development or very beginning of developing um, individual electronics boxes, let's say on a spacecraft, it's not appropriate to try and use an end-to-end -end operational scenario because there's a lot of baggage associated with that. There's often um, uh, in, in what would be seen in that phase of the mission as artificial restrictions on telemetry bandwidth, for instance, or, or, or commanding rates or things like that. Um, that you don't want to, to saddle your engineers with during this early phase. And so um, for all of this stuff, for Newstar and for ICON, when individual engineers are working on individual boxes before they start getting into sort of a more integrated framework, yes, they are using their own dedicated tools. They have a, a Windows box with a terminal emulator where they're you know, actually talking to their box by banging on the keyboard and, and looking at screens and things like that. Um, but the idea is to, as soon as it's reasonable, is to try and get the mission operation system into the hands of the developers and the users so that they can not only help you um, uh, find issues with that and get ready um, uh, for the INT phase, but just to, um, to try and make sure that everything's going to come together smoothly and that you don't have a, a big um, a sea change when you get to integration phases of things. Uh, for instance, on ICON, we have those six instruments coming in from the four teams. Those are all going to get um, uh, integrated onto a payload platform at UC Berkeley at the end of next year. Um, at that point, they're going to have to talk through um, an, an instrument uh, control processor that Will's writing the flight software for. Before that, it would be conceivable that they could use, use their own EGSE to get high-rate data. Um, but after that point, they're going to actually have to be talking through that particular computer using that software. And so it could be pretty ugly if the first time they saw that was when they showed up at Berkeley. But what we're doing is, is before that, to all the, um, uh, the institutions were supplying uh, workstations with the ITOS system and with um, various simulators, either software or hardware, a mix of both, um, that actually implement this, this mission operations chain so that uh, when they show up at Berkeley, they will have already been flowing data through the architecture um, and the commanding and the telemetry will look, will look similar to them. Um, off on the right-hand side of the picture is um, uh, 
Uh, one of the things we do is, is uh, from the very beginning of this process, even when instrument teams are doing development at their own facilities, um, is all the telemetry data um, gets uh, put into a MySQL telemetry database um, in their workstation at their facility, but it also gets um, sent over to a master archive at Berkeley when there's an internet connection available. And so from the, from the beginning of the New Star mission, when the Caltech team started doing their instrument development and when the spacecraft folks first turned on the computer, we have all that telemetry in this MySQL database. Um, and engineers can go back and they can pull up strip charts um, for that data, look at individual data points, generate reports, um, on-time reports, for instance, all of a sudden become really easy when you're recording all of that data because you know actually how many frames of data is coming down from your instrument. You know um, how long it's been powered on. So um, having a, a command and telemetry um, a database that uh, you keep everything in has been uh, really useful, and we're doing the same thing on, um, on ICON. So once I said, once again, um, it's sort of this uh, uh, test like you fly, fly like you, like you test philosophy, try and get everybody using this system so that there aren't any surprises down the road and that people understand about limitations associated with, um, uh, with doing recorder dumps that you may not get your science data until the end of a ground station pass, for instance. Early in the process, um, that's one of these artificial restrictions that, that you don't um, enforce on the engineers in the beginning. But then um, uh, as you go later and later in the, in the development process, you start giving them the capability to simulate the spacecraft recorders and to do recorder dumps and look at the implications for, um, you know, when you have to do commanding with a low rate, um, a simulated low rate telemetry, and then you have to um, get your spacecraft recorded uh, dumped data after the ground station pass is completed, for instance. Um, so uh, we've put together a bunch of um, portable ground stations that run this ITOS system and all the ancillary stuff, and we supply um, a number of copies of those to the to the spacecraft folks. So the um, the ACS team at Orbital and the flight software team at Orbital have flat sats, and they also have their own um, individual workstations where they have ITOS, and they can use it to command their software and see what goes on. And um, we've just uh, uh, last month supplied the first ITOS system to the IVM team at UT Dallas. And uh, early next year, we'll be in the process of, um, of uh, sending uh, ground stations out to the other instrument teams. Um, so I'm going to try and speed up a little bit. Um, uh, kind of an eye chart here, but the idea was to um, to show you sort of the number of simulators that we're developing to send out to the instrument teams. So the, the common theme here is that they all get um, ITOS workstations with some sort of uh, spacecraft simulator EGSE that looks like the, the spacecraft um, to instrument suite interfaces. And then most of the instrument teams, um, the IVM team, for instance, has a very simple interface to the instrument control processor that runs the entire instrument suite. So all of the stuff that they get is, um, is essentially simulated, a spacecraft simulator and an ICP simulator all in software. Um, the other instruments have um, much more complicated in interfaces that are implemented in FPGAs to handle uh, high data rates and uh, averaging of images and, and various uh, um, compression algorithms and things like that. So what we're doing there is um, we had committed to building a number of uh, engineering models of the flight hardware that were going to be um, uh, identical except for non-flight parts to the actual flight ICP computers. So these things would have the same processor um, they would run the actual flight software, um, and so that uh, they'd, there'd be a very high fidelity um, uh, simulation of the interface that the, that the instrumenters would see when they actually delivered and talked up to their flight, um, their flight instruments. Um, so this was our grand plan in the beginning, and then, um, you know, of course, one of the issues with these small missions is always resources, and um, building all these uh, emulators is actually moderately expensive. Um, uh, stuffing the boards is pretty easy. You know, it's gotten, it's really cool now. You can, um, you can get a board from a board house in a, in a week, 
and they'll um, they'll stuff all the parts for you and things like that. But then once that that raw board gets back in house and you have to put it in a uh, in a frame, uh, even if you're CNCing the frame just like you you CNC'd the flight frames. All of a sudden, you're looking at having to do things like connectors, and then you're having to look at doing the testing of these boards. And instead of doing one or two flight boards, all of a sudden, you know, now you're talking about doing five or six of these systems. Um, and so we're running up against some schedule issues, and we've had to pare down um, this idea of giving every one of the instrument teams a... Uh, a full-up um, EM version of the ICP, and some of the teams are going to have to be sharing this stuff, and some of them are going to have to be using simulators. So that's one of the lessons learned here is this stuff costs money, um, and uh, we, we ran out of commitment from our management to actually you know, go the whole distance with this stuff um, in terms of, of cost and schedule and developing all of this EGSE. Um, Blah, 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 blah. ITOS, um, you know, there are a handful of different um, standards out there for ground operating systems. ITOS is the one that we use, as I mentioned, because it came out of our, our experience with the Goddard folks, and it's been, been good for us. But um, uh, there are a number of other ones. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, nothing about this concept is, is, uh, is tied to ITOS. This is all stuff that you could do with some other um, uh, environment, if you can get your users to um, agree to to try and use your mission operation system early on um, as opposed to using their own uh, tools that they may be more comfortable with in house and so what it really comes down to is that you 'll probably have to volunteer to supply resources um, to help their engineers um, uh, come up on the learning curve for this ITOS or for whatever ground system you want them to try and use early on in the program. Um, I did want to mention that we are using uh, configuration management with a system called Git, which is a, a distributed tool that maintains uh, configuration control databases um, locally. One of the issues we had on Newstar was the use of SVN, and the orbital folks were concerned that when they were running spacecraft tests, that if there was an internet outage, that they might not um, have the ability to go back and, and roll back to previous versions of test scripts, for instance. And so uh, we did a fairly complicated multi-SVN. And SVN has um, just one master database that has to live on one machine. And so um, we came up with a rather complicated artificial way of having multiple copies of that that we get synchronized. Um, Git, however, is much more clever about this, and it maintains archives in a distributed fashion. And so um, uh, you do have everything locally on your machine once you, once you agree to accept those changes into your machine. And uh, it got away with this, with this issue of what happens if the Internet, down, if the internet goes down, we can't uh, roll back. Um, so we really like the idea of using um, integrated mock software early. If you can convince your users, and you, you don't want to do this too early because you don't want to make it painful for the, for the users, um, but, but on the other hand, you want to make sure that they're up to speed and, and comfortable with things before you expect them to show up and work in an integrated environment with other instruments and especially with your, with your spacecraft um, vendor. And we also think it's been really successful, at least on Newstar, and it looks like it's working out to be successful with ICON, at um, uh, providing people with simulators so that they get a, a useful end-to-end a flow of, of data. The disadvantage of this is that um, it really forces you to nail down your interfaces and what the data looks like and what the commanding looks like early in the mission um, because you have to get this stuff in place early enough to, um, to let it get into the development cycle. And so it's kind of tough in there in that um, things aren't finalized, and yet you're trying to finalize things. So you have to be willing to accept that, that there are going to be changes in the ICDs and uh, that packet formats are going to change and that conversion factors in telemetry are going to be different and, and things like that. And you just have to sort of be willing to, uh, to embrace uh, change like that. Um, and I'm at the top of the hour, and so let me um, uh, 
just stop there, and uh, maybe if we do one or two minutes worth of questions, we can pretty much stay on, stay on track. Your dedication to schedule is admirable. Okay, and come and find me after. You know, I'll be wandering around, and we can chat if there's anything you want to talk about. You mentioned that you're you're using ITOS for all of the simulators and for the development. I'm I'm actually impressed that you managed to get the spacecraft provider to use ITOS, the same uh, system as Mach, on on a number of missions that I've been involved in. That's a that's always a question: which ground system are we going to use and when? Um, and that's an important part of the planning. So I mean that seems like a smart thing that you did there. Um, one of the things I had a question about is in terms of of ITOS, are you using the government version of ITOS or the commercial version? Um, I'll treat that as two, quest two questions or whatever. So, yeah, um, I did want to say that um, I was really impressed and happy with the New Star team at Orbital Sciences Corporation, who were the ones who were willing to step up and say, yes, we will, you know, we'll hinge our spacecraft delivery upon this outside software product. So I thought that that was really gutsy of them. And, um, uh, Dave Oberg was the guy, and so if you ever have a chance to work with Dave Oberg at Orbital, um, you should take it because he's a wonderful guy. Um, the version of ITOS we're using comes from Hammers, and uh, the deal is because we're an educational institution working on a NASA mission, we can get essentially unlimited copies of that from them. Uh, if you're a commercial company, you'll have to pay for ITOS. Well, I think that that, ver that depends too. If you're using it on a government program, you can you can go through the route of, of using the government uh, provided copy of it as in in, a, in order to agree for that for for the for the mission. But it's still I'm impressed that you managed to get the spacecraft provider to use it. It's usually a difficult thing to say this is something we're going to use through the through the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, it took a lot of convincing for the orbital folks, and we had to, um, you know, we walked in and they said, well, if we're going to do this, then you're going to have to support us. And so um, what that essentially meant was um, we probably had three FTEs, I'm guessing, for the spacecraft development of the program, funded out of Berkeley, out of our, out of our portion of the New Star budget, um, supporting the spacecraft folks. So Orbital basically got two or three bodies um, free to, to do this stuff for them. So that's not an inconsiderable, you know, donation in, in kind on our part. Um, but uh, yeah, no, so I was, I was impressed that they were willing to do that, especially, you know, given that we hadn't um, worked with them before and, and if we had messed up that um, it, it could have really torpedoed their schedule and they would have gotten in trouble for that. So, yeah, so once again, Dave Oberg, Orbital, he's the man. I, one quick question about the CCSDS transfer frame. You, so you had, did you assign a different virtual channel to each um, payload into the spacecraft in order to separate them as they, when they came across? Um, on New Star, so no, what we're doing is basically everything is based on app IDs. And so, so that's... The packet, at the packet layer then? Because the transfer frame has a whole has a sync word and like a whole bunch of overhead. So was it was it actually the packet? So what we're doing is it, it's a funny mix of stuff in that all of the the real time transfer of data between all the different software elements all happens with transfer frames, and then stuff that gets stuck into the MySQL database's telemetry is um, is app ID. Um, Sure. CCSDS packets with a few extra things. So we added some extra time tags so that you could know, um, you know, like the receipt times of stuff so you could figure out where things were coming from. And um, uh, we also added some different, uh, uh, you know, um, if you were doing a New Star instrument development, that ground station was trained to put stuff into a different set of tables so that you, um, you basically um, separated flight hardware-generated telemetry from 
EM generated telemetry from simulated generated from simulation generated telemetry so that you could then go back after the fact and do these statistics like um, uh, doing uh, hardware runtime stuff. Um, we ended up having some automated pages that at midnight got updated out of the telemetry database with the current runtimes for all the various subsystems, um, EMs and flight hardware. And that, surprisingly, I didn't think it would be that exciting. But for the management teams, that turned out to be, you know, just overwhelmingly exciting that they could, on a day-by-day -day basis, know how we were doing in terms of getting a a burn time on various systems. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes? No. Okay, thanks very much, folks. Oh, maybe, maybe one. Sorry, it wasn't so much a question as much answering yours. I mean, uh, working at Orbital, so we um, typically keep our, our payloads and internal to our buses on the packet level, like you were saying with the app IDs, and then use uh, multiple virtual channels to do um, back orbit storage versus real-time telemetry, uh, and that's at our, um, you know, transmitting from the spacecraft to the ground level. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, folks.